Welcome viewers to the series, Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. This episode is entitled, Beating the Climate Crisis at the Ballot Box. My name is Kate Goodman, class of 2024 at Middlebury College, and I would like to introduce this episode's guest speaker. I'm joined today by Ben Wessel, class of 2011, Executive Director at NextGen America. Welcome, and thank you for joining us, Ben. Thanks for having me, Kate. This series explores a number of different professional areas involved in the green economy. Will you tell us a little about your organization and how it fits within the green economy? Yeah, so Next Gen America is the nation's largest youth vote organization. We work to turn out young people to support progressive candidates in elections across the country. Um, but interestingly, Next Gen America started out as Next Gen Climate, where we were an organization geared at mobilizing climate voters, people who really had um, sustainability and, and taking action on climate change at the top of their mind when they went to the ballot box. After the 2016 presidential election, uh, we decided to go a little bit more multi-issue progressive, knowing that um, the people, the voters that we were really engaging most, the young people, aren't single issue voters, right? Climate change is the same as uh, you know, caring about climate action is the same as um, wanting to be bold on the economy and expand access to health care and fight for racial justice. And so we started talking to the whole, uh, the whole voter, if you will. But I will say climate change and, and the transition to clean energy continues to be one of the top things motivating young people to support progressive candidates. Do you think, just wondering about y'all's focus, do you think you lose voters by having such a progressive, holistic campaign? Yeah, our our approach is that there's a ton of young people who hold progressive beliefs who need to be motivated to cast a ballot. They don't necessarily think that voting is a even really a tool in their toolbox for change. And so our job is to show people actually that's not quite the that's not the calculus maybe that that we expect you to take and we want folks young people in particular to recognize that they have so much power that they can exercise through the ballot box. So we're mostly about motivating and turning out people who we think are likely to agree with us, but maybe likely to disagree on like the, you know, the lever to pull to get change in the world. But I will say we know that young people across the country, whether they're Democrat, Republican, independent, who knows what, um, tend to hold pretty progressive issue beliefs, right? So we use our times and energy to persuade people to vote for progressive or democratic candidates based on the key issues that we know matter to them. And so even though we talked to lots of folks whose parents are Republicans who don't know any Democrats in their lives, um, when we talked to them about raising the minimum wage, about student debt forgiveness and about transitioning to clean energy, they're like, yeah, I'm for that. Does that make me a Democrat? And sometimes the answer is yeah. Yeah, that's great. What do you see like as the future for your organization? I know this most recent election had a huge youth voter turnout. Um, is that going to keep increasing or was it yeah, just so, something? No, year after year, we keep seeing the youth turnout increase. So we know, you know, Next Gen really started in earnest in 2014. And every two years when we have big national election cycles, we see increased youth voter turnout. And 2020 was, of course, um, the pinnacle is the highest youth turnout ever, uh, but that still was really only um, like 55, 56% of young people showing up and voting. So we know there's a ton of room to grow. And luckily we're fighting for some pro voter policies that we know will make it easier for young people to cast a ballot, like automatic voter registration or, or um, universal mail-in balloting. So Trump was obviously a motivator, but it wasn't enough to just get people to the polls. And we know that as we move forward, there's a lot of work to do to continue to keep youth turnout high. And I think with a very socially engaged generation like Gen Z aging into the electorate, we're likely to see turnout continue to increase. Yeah, I mean, 2020 brought to light so many conversations on equity and justice with the global pandemic, um, a huge presidential election and the nationwide reckoning on race. How did that, those events come into play in your work last year? And yeah, <laughs> I mean, casual, right? Like the whole <laughs> world is being flipped upside down. And I really think that really means that young people are saying, wow, we, this is a time of great upheaval and great change and we can actually make a huge difference, right? It's when things are stagnant and nothing seems like it's gonna get better or any worse is when people are sort of blase and sort of tune out of politics. But um, you know, between the the uprising in the streets where where 
really, I think for the first time, we saw a multiracial coalition of young people stepping out into the streets and fighting back against racism and and for a, a more just policing system where we saw sort of solidarity amongst different components of sort of the youth electorate, um, all getting screwed over by the pandemic, all having a hard time mm -hmm. making their bills meet. Um, and as the climate crisis continues to rear its ugly head in new and novel ways across the country, whether it's wildfires, floods, droughts, uh, freak Arctic freezes across your home state of Texas, I think we are seeing a renewed sense of commitment from young people that like, this is not going to solve itself. Like all these problems are things that we have some agency over and and we have something to do about it. I think the giant challenge that I as a political organi uh, organizer or really that that candidates for office have is to connect um, voting to being like a legitimate way to get change on some of those things. And it's important for me that people recognize that. And we'll talk about this, I'm sure, you know, my sort of career journey, like voting is not the only way to solve these problems. And in fact, all sorts of activism and all sorts of advocacy and all sorts of just leadership in your own community um, sort of complete that toolbox for change. But I do think we'd be foolish not to use all the tools uh, at our disposal. Cool. What is y'all's main approach to reaching out to young voters? Because I know like what medias do you use or? Yeah, totally. Well, talk about how COVID has sort of switched up what we normally do. I mean, we um, we recognize that young people are complete people who exist everywhere, whether that's online, whether it's reading the news, whether it's in person. And so we try to uh, appeal to the whole voter and engage with them wherever we can. So like our bread and butter work traditionally has been on the ground, face-to-face -face organizing, having real conversations peer-to-peer -peer about the stakes of an election and also being sort of voter concierges. How do you register to vote? How do you request an absentee ballot? How do you make sure you're not the embarrassing person in the dining hall whose mail-in ballot got rejected <laughs> or whatever? And so um, we tend to really focus on the, the power of, of grassroots organizing face-to-face. -face. Obviously, COVID made that a bit trickier and in march 2020 we went 100% virtual but luckily we know that young people already spent a lot of their times online and on their phones and so we we tried everything we could right we ran a bunch of digital advertisements it's something that we've perfected i think over the course of the last four or five years where um we don't want them to feel like a political ad and we want it to be real talk and we want to persuade people that voting is worth their while. And some of the times the way you do that is is on a, a, a you know, six second YouTube little pre-roll ad. And sometimes that's through a five minute segment with Complex Magazine talking about the history of district attorneys races. There's so many different ways to sort of communicate with folks through ads online. But we actually think one of the most successful things we can do online is just really organize our peers. So we got um, 1,700 Instagram and TikTok and YouTube influencers to be partners with us to communicate about how to vote and where to vote and what's at stake in this election. Um, you know, we infiltrated Facebook groups and Reddit threads to sort of communicate about the stakes of the election. We um, sent almost 30 million text messages and made about 10 million phone calls to young people in key battleground states just to have real conversations about like, hey, what's going on? And and what's cool is we see those those young people that we successfully organized um, that we called and texted and had these conversations with or got to register to vote or pledge to vote. They turned out about 13 points higher than their peers. So we know there's a real impact in terms of whether this actually worked at reaching people. And then we did some like old school stuff. We like sent people snail mail. Why? Because it's crazy when you get a postcard and people are excited about <laughs> it. And so you've got to just sort of couple all the tactics together. But we know that there's, the landscape is always shifting and we're always thinking at NextGen, how do we use um, Twitch or Discord or Steam? How are we going to be the ones who are doing sneaker giveaways on Instagram lives at the same time that we're talking about how to participate in the election? Like we know that as young people are the people who change and set the terms of the cultural conversation in this country that we've got to sort of uh, adapt and abide by those changes as well. So can you speak a little to your specific role in the organization? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a wild journey. So I started at NextGen really in 2014 as a kind of junior level staffer working with partners to make sure our, our work was sort of aligned with some of our allies, whether it's, you know, the League of Conservation Voters in the Sierra Club or big unions or whatever. And slowly but surely throughout the years, I kind of um, outlasted a lot of my peers. And, and starting in 2019, um, I was named the executive director, which is basically top dog. And so that's everything. Oh, gosh, it's a really stressful role. Um, it's everything from, you know, making sure you make payroll and ensuring all your HR policies are set and no one's breaking the law by accident to setting programmatic vision for the organization. What elections are we going to care about and how are we going to outreach to young people in those elections um, to raising money and making sure our board of directors is happy um, you know, going on TV and talking to the press, like it's a very, one of the things I love about the job is it changes every day. And what I have to do every day is incredibly different. Um, I will say it's stressful as hell to manage dozens, if not hundreds of staff. Um, yeah. How many employees do you have? It, we changed with like the sort of election cycle. So mm -hmm. at peak in 2020, we had about 250 full-time staff, which is a lot. Wow. We're at our lowest ebb right now, which means we're at 24. So you can see we really grow and shrink a lot. Um, we're really all about empowering young people to speak to their own communities. I mean, the stuff that Sophia, who's a 23-year-old who lives in Orlando, on our staff comes up with is way different than what I would come up with as a 32 year old who lives in San Francisco. And so I'm so passionate about empowering young people in their own communities to make a real change. And so the team is incredibly racially diverse, especially out when you go across the states. We know, like, for example, in in Michigan, one of our biggest challenges is ensuring that we're getting young black and brown Michiganders to show up at the polls and if you hire a bunch of people who've never been to Michigan and are only white people like you're never going to be successful and so we try to match demographics with our community and hire from within the communities there's so many activists and advocates especially um, on campuses who are already doing the work who don't recognize that they can do it with the support and training of a big national organization and so we're always out there trying to identify the leaders who could use some juice behind them to really kick some tail. So, you know, just like at Middlebury, at, at the University of Nevada, Reno, there's a student organization that is gonna be spending time registering voters and communicating about how to get to the polls. Well, what if they became next-gen fellows or next-gen organizers could have access to voter guides, a budget for donuts, and, and some training so that they understand the most sort of convincing and persuasive messages. That's sort of our, our main reason for being. Yeah, that's great. What do you look for? Like, keep in mind that there are like 18 to 22 year olds watching this who are roughly, hopefully thinking about career field. What kind of skills do you look for in hiring? Totally. I mean, there's nothing that replaces like honest passion and commitment to doing the work. So like people who are fired up about politics or not even politics, but people who are fired up about organizing their peers. Maybe they're the people who are like obsessed with creating scavenger hunts or really um, overcomplicated theme parties or are always the person who's raising their hand in the class to sort of lead a project. Those kinds of folks who are creative and interested and in sort of engaging with their community, it, that's always the person who's going to succeed the most. Like there's no replacement for... Um, <laughs> charisma, I guess. Um, not telling anyone to change their personality here, but like, I think uh, we get so locked into these, oh, okay, what are the classes I have to take? Oh, do I have to read Politico every morning in order to be a successful organizer? No, you have to have a commitment and dedication to your like fellow community members and have a real passion for engaging people to, to find the ways that their lives can improve. So to me, it's always about, um, what are the things you're doing outside the classroom? Like, I don't really care if you're an A student or a C student, but if you're spending time, um, you know, working in a restaurant, you probably have a lot more social skills than someone uh, who doesn't really engage with many people every day. Those are the sorts of things that I think are really important to us. And then the other thing I would say is folks who have a uh, little shamelessness, to be honest, are always successful. So who are the people who are willing to um, 
paint their face for a hockey game or just be a little strange and outside the box of what's traditionally accepted. Um, those are the sorts of people who are going to recognize, you know what, I know how we're going to register more voters. We are going to have pinatas full of clipboards, full of registration forms, and people are going to want to be a part of that. Like, great. Those are the kinds of people that I think really succeed in our field. Um, I know you're an environmental studies major with a focus on policy at MIT. Can you talk at all from your path from campus to your career? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I came into Middlebury in the fall of 2007, uh, like a very interesting and exciting time, I think, around climate action. You know, Middlebury College was already sort of viewed as a hub of environmental activism across the country. And I walked into a campus that had been mobilized really for the first time and a big grassroots show of support on climate action. So it was pretty clear to me as someone who was always thinking about how do I sort of stand up for my generation that climate change was probably the best example we had of intergenerational like inequity. Um, and so when I got to campus, I spent a lot of time getting involved with the Sunday night group, which was a campus climate and environmental group. Um, I took a lot of classes that were geared around the climate crisis to sort of understand why we weren't taking action on it, not so much the science, but more the yeah. people component. Um, and I really liked it. I really liked doing everything in the classroom, but to be frank, like most of the experience I got was outside the classroom. It was getting my peers to go to DC for a big climate conference called Power Shift that happened in 2009. I like dropped out of college for a semester, took a semester off and, and worked to try and get the UN to take bolder action on climate action. I like really engaged with a lot of young alumni who were friends of friends of friends, older students when I was a first or second year student um, or friends of professors and just was like, yo, what do you wish you had done when you were 20 on campus because you have free time and like access to all these amazing <laughs> resources. Um, and I really took that advice to heart. Um, when I graduated, I was already a bit of a veteran of sort of the youth climate movement. I'd been engaged with sort of peers across the country on this stuff. And I was like, one of the things that I had learned throughout that work while I was a student activist was sometimes you can have the best argument possible, but if you don't have the right people in positions of power, it doesn't really matter how good your argument is, they're still gonna ignore you. And so I really wanted to get more experience doing electoral work. So my first, my first real job out of Middlebury was working on President Obama's re-election campaign in 2012, where a mid alum hired me to be the youth vote director for the state of New Hampshire. And I got hooked and I understood this is such a concrete way for youth to be making a difference by showing that we have power in numbers, that there's more young people than there are older people out there. We just show up at half the rates. And so when we turn out to vote, politicians have no choice but to, to pay attention to what we're saying. So started out very climatey, got outside my climate bubble a little bit once I left school, um, came back into the climate movement, worked at 350.org with many Middlebury alums and the one, the only Bill McKibben. Um, and then eventually met um, this, this uh, very passionate and very wealthy guy named Tom Steyer, who's the main funder uh, of NextGen. Um, so how big a role, like this series is about transitioning to a green economy um, and I guess expanding that a just transition to a green economy is what we want. How big a role do you think voting and politics have in that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can make the transition that we need without changing the people who are in charge. And then once we change the people who are in charge, we need to hold them accountable to make sure they're doing things that actually lead to a just transition, not just saying things about the just transition. So whether it's um, getting involved in a, a, a candidate's campaign or organizing young people to vote or even just like going to a town hall or calling or writing your mayor or your congressperson or the president, all of that matters. I just don't think it's the only thing that matters. And one of the things that's so exciting to me are the new and innovative ways that young people are deciding to engage with politics that aren't just sort of suit and tie. Uh, 
And I think there's a, a huge, tremendous role for protest and for demanding what we need, not what's feasible. And there's a huge role for people who, to be artists or content creators and inspire the hell out of their community into action without it actually being communicating with like policymakers. I just think each one of the things that I really encourage folks to do is to not sort of silo themselves off and say, I have to pick an avenue of change. Like it's fluid. It should be fluid based on sort of the the extenuating circumstances. So like my example is, you know, a favorite Middlebury memory of mine was Earth Day 2010, 2011, maybe, where we were just feeling, we as SG were feeling totally overwhelmed by all these expectations to like do something really amazing and powerful for Earth Day. We we're like, Earth Day is a stupid holiday. Every day should be Earth Day. And we were like, this is not a very, <laughs> there was no legislation going on. There was no big march to Montpelier. There was nothing going on. And we were like, you know what? Let's just like make a giant cake because it will be really fun. And so we baked a huge sheet cake and we frosted it with a map of the world and we had it in like the Great Hall and by Hall. One of the things that I think is so interesting about Middlebury that people often don't recognize is that you're surrounded by people who want to help you out. Everyone who works at the college is, whether they're staff or faculty, is like committed to making sure young people are having a good time and safely. And so everything from, you know, being, I remember like the first crew of people who were trying to put stickers on light switches that were like, be bright, turn out the light, like back in the early days of sort of residential energy conservation. And because they were friends with custodial staff, it was pretty easy to convince them to say, hey, can we put a bunch of stickers on the wall? Like just not writing off anyone um, who's a potential ally and trying to get done something that you wanna get done. And the thing that's so nice about Middlebury compared to like the outside world is there's a bunch of people whose inclination to say, yeah, I'd love to help you with that. What can I do? It's just a, you know, it's easy to romanticize when you're 10 years out, but like, it's such a place where everyone is willing and sort of down just to try a thing. And I'd encourage students to recognize that, like, there's a million different sorts of people that you should meet while you're at Middlebury who can all help you get done what you're trying to get done. Yeah, that's great. And I imagine it can be applied to like networking in the career world too. Think about your best case scenario for where we will be in 20 or 30 years. What is one word that will have gotten us there? Commitment. All right. Just people, people being down and not flaking uh, when something isn't working and just, just muddying through. It's not a linear path to get to sort of a clean just transition. It's going to just try, it's going to take some commitment. What advice do you give in as many words as you want? to Middlebury students who want to pursue that commitment in their career and on campus? Yeah, I would say never, don't turn down any opportunity because it's not the opportunity you expected. I think people have this strange fantasy about, oh, I can picture this dream job and I'm going to go only for that dream job, or I have to go to grad school in order to, to really fight for this thing I care about. And I think it's actually a little bit of faith to just like try a bunch of things and see what sticks and lean into what feels right and what you're good at um, and ask your friends for help and ask your community for help. My first job out of Middlebury was hired by a middle on my second job after that was also hired by a middle on like I had help find the helper people who love to connect humans. Just make sure your work life doesn't become your social life. <laughs> Don't be stressed as a first year. That's the other thing. I mean, look, this is the thing that I think I I really learned at Middlebury was I learned so much more outside the classroom than I did inside. I loved classes and I loved school. And it's really fun to learn and like nail a paper and like just tick off every piece of reading in your syllabus. But don't expect that that's what's really preparing you for the world writ large. It's actually the people that you meet and the memories that you make and sort of the things that felt fun. Um, those, in my experience, taught me a lot more about what I do now than, no offense, anything I learned inside the classroom. But some of that was 
becoming homies with professors. And like, that was really cool. And that's a unique opportunity that you have at Middlebury to like, you know, live down the block from your professor and have it not be weird when you sit next to each other on the ski lift. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's a great wrap. Ben, thank you once again for coming to talk with us, de-stress us about COVID. Hey, no problem. <laughs> um, this concludes this episode within the series Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. In closing, I want to encourage viewers to tune in to get career perspectives and advice from a number of other professionals um, in the other episodes in these series. I also want to encourage you to tune in to the other Midvantage series which can be accessed through the events and programs tabs on the CCI website. Thank you again for watching.